Welcome to this episode of the Vero and Vortex, a podcast in which we discuss infectious disease across skills, from molecules and pathogens to populations and pandemics and everything in between. My name is Jaap de Rode. I'm a biology professor here at Emory University, and I'm also your host for today's show. And with me today is Ben Loppen, professor of epidemiology in the Roman School of Public Health here at Emory as well. Ben, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So Ben, you have done a lot of research on infectious diseases and so you have worked a lot on SARS-CoV-2 recently, but before that, you spent a lot of your time looking at rotavirus. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So, right, I'm, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, and before I came to Emory in 2017, I worked at, at CDC for, for nearly a decade, and mm -hmm. focus of my work when I was there was on diarrheal diseases, and have continued to do that work mm -hmm. still. Uh, rotavirus is the most common cause of severe diarrheal disease mm -hmm. in kids in high and low income countries alike, but really the severe disease burden and mortality is in low income right. settings. Yeah. Fortunately, we have a vaccine now against rotavirus. And so mm -hmm. a lot of my work has been uh, evaluating that vaccine and understanding how, how well it works. And kids all over the world get infected with rotavirus. Certainly before we had vaccines, basically every kid got infected by the fifth birthday. Mm -hmm. The difference is that in low-income countries, uh, that's where the disease often turns severe. Mm -hmm. It's because kids either are malnourished, don't have good access to, to health care and treatment. And so the dehydration that results from the diarrheal disease, from the gastroenteritis, can, can result in, in some more severe disease, even, even death. We estimate mm -hmm. approximately 125,000 deaths still occur due to oh, rotavirus wow. annually. Uh, globally. Over 100 countries have introduced the rotavirus vaccine. It was introduced in the U.S., which is one of the early adopter okay. countries. We introduced the vaccine here in uh, 2008, approximately, um, to great effect. Hospitalizations have reduced 80 to 90 percent um, from pre-vaccine, 50,000 hospitalizations a year in this country, way down. Wow. But over 100 countries have now introduced yeah. the vaccine. Yeah. And so, it worked really well here. Does it work well everywhere? Sure. Yeah, this has been a, this has been a good uh, large focus of, of my research. Exactly. Well, there's probably a range of reasons, and still we don't understand them completely. Uh, things like malnutrition, kids who are more poorly nourished don't respond as well mm -hmm. to the vaccine. Okay. Also, in these kind of low income settings, uh, kids are exposed to lots of different pathogens. And so they've got right. co-infections mm -hmm. and those co-infections might reduce their response yeah. to, to vaccination. Is that because the immune system is busy with other things? Yeah, okay. right. Exactly. The, the, exactly. The immune system seems to be kind of um, um, activated for lots of, uh, yeah. lots of pathogens and doesn't respond as, as robustly, as strongly to. So are you still working on this and finding ways to, to make these vaccines work better or have you kind of shifted to other questions? Yeah, well, uh, yes, both. Um, okay. We are still working on on these vaccines, or in fact, new vaccine in the pipeline mm -hmm. that we hope will overcome okay. some of these these issues, as well as some interventions. But also, we've done a lot of work, um, as I think most infectious disease epidemiologists did, in on the pandemic and responding yeah. to the pandemic. Yeah. So when SARS-CoV-2 hit the hit the world, a lot of people with expertise like you started working on that. So. Tell us a little bit about how your expertise with rotavirus and other infectious diseases helped you really jump onto this disease and make us understand this pandemic better and maybe help us. You know, we stayed home from work. Yeah. Um, many of us who, who could, we reduced a lot of our social contacts yeah. and that slowed down disease, disease transmission. And so yeah. a lot of my group's work during the pandemic was actually measuring the human behavior aspects that were relevant to um, to SARS-CoV-2, COVID transmission, yeah. but also had implications for lots of other, lots of other pathogens, rotavirus, flu included. Mm -hmm. So what was one of the most surprising things that you found? So we all experienced this social distancing. It was, you know, a lot of people gave up their social lives, individuals changed their behaviors, but then some people said, no way, I'm not going to do this because I don't believe any of it. So, right. but in your work, what was one of the most surprising things that you found through this study? Yeah. Yeah. So we did a, a range of studies and one of them I'll mention is a study we call Global Mix, um, which was a study, is a study, which is still underway mm -hmm. in um, low middle income country settings uh, where also, of course, people 
you know, change to behavior in response to the pandemic. This is a study in Mozambique, Guatemala, India, and Pakistan in both urban and rural mm-hmm. settings, each of those countries wow. where we measured people's contact yeah. uh, behavior. A really challenging study to conduct at any time, especially yeah. during, during a pandemic, as you could, you could imagine. Um, I think one of the things that surprised us was even during lockdown periods, contact rates very high in those settings compared to Europe and in the US, mm. right? I think people, you know, for various reasons, living in larger households, having mm. bigger kind of social networks, and also maybe because in lower income settings, people uh, need to c- keep interacting for, for work. Right. And so that obviously yeah. has big implications for, yeah. for disease transmission. Yeah. yeah, you and I could go home and take our internet with us, take our computers and right. keep on working, but that is not the same for 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 a lot of people that have jobs where they have to be on site and interact yeah. with each other. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. And I mean, related to that, even even in these settings, of course, there's you know a range of of kind of socioeconomic income levels. Yeah, and we found that in one of the things that surprised us actually in urban areas, um, people had lower levels of contact than in rural areas. And I think it speaks to exactly the mm. point you just raised, which is that even in lower income settings. It, many people are for professionals in urban areas and can reduce their contacts, which you know is in a rural areas where farming, fishing, those kinds of um, occupations are more yeah. common. People are less able to change their behavior and adapt right. and protect themselves. Yeah. So knowing this is one thing, but then what are we going to do with that information? Yeah. Well, it's a good question. We, as those of us in infectious disease epidemiology and in public health, we use that data in our models mm-hmm. of infectious disease transmission and. We, we, this is critical information if you're going to have a realistic model and you're going to ask questions like, what would be the effect of introducing a vaccine? How frequently should we mm-hmm. have vaccine boosters? What would be the effects of reducing social, of, of increasing social distancing, you know, having non-pharmaceutical interventions like we did during the pandemic? We really need this fundamental information yeah. if we want to have, mm-hmm. um, if we want to have realistic models to ask those kinds of questions yeah and so creating these models and these tools will help us for the next pandemic we we hope so we yeah. certainly hope so and we're going to continue this this line of work um because we have identified there's this real kind of gap in collecting that yeah. that information so given all that do you feel like we're more prepared for the next one than we were for sars cov 2 yeah this is a terrific and a, a big question i think from the scientific mm-hmm. point of view the fields our fields have advanced so much okay. right in terms of vaccinology, in terms of, of model development, of, co- of standing up new data streams that we would need to respond. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I think um, you know there's a there's a lot of fatigue from from the pandemic. So you know I think in some ways we're more prepared scientifically, but um, uh, I'm not so sure society is as uh, as advanced in the same way. All right, yeah, and that is a uh, difficult problem that we cannot solve overnight and. We really have to work on that together as a society. Mm -hmm. Well, Ben, it was really nice having you on the show. It's really great to hear about your research on rotavirus and your current work where you hope to prevent the next pandemic. And I wish you all the luck doing that. We hope you have enjoyed this episode and look forward to seeing you again. Thanks for watching.